Hey everyone, welcome to Signal Processing with Paul. And in this video, what I wanna do is talk about phasers. So if you don't know what a phaser is, you're in the right place. We're gonna explain them and explain why they are useful. So to get started, um, phasers are simply a way of representing sines and cosines as the real or imaginary part of a complex exponential. And this comes directly out of Euler's formula. So what we have in Euler's formula is e to the j theta equals cosine of theta plus j sine of theta. And phasers are a way of going backwards from sines and cosines to exponentials as opposed to the other way around. So if I want to write cosine of theta as a complex exponential, I can simply write it as the real part of e to the j theta. This is equal to cosine of theta. And I can write the imaginary part of e to the j theta as equal to simply sine of theta, like so. So this is what it allows us to do. Now suppose we want to write cosine as the imaginary part of a complex exponential, or write sine as the real part of an, a complex exponential. Well, we can do this as well, and the best way to do this is to multiply Euler's expression by j on both sides. So what we have is j e to the j theta equals j cosine of theta, and then we have j times j, which is just minus 1, so we're going to have minus sine of theta, like so. Now, before we start writing this, um, I want you to remember that the number j is taking the vector 1 and rotating it by basically an angle pi over 2. So the, the number j is 0 plus 1 times j. So you can get this into polar form by basically saying the magnitude of j is equal to 0 squared plus 1 squared equals 1, and the angle of j is equal to the arctangent of the imaginary part, which is 1 over 0, and the arctangent of this is simply pi over 2. So what we can say is the this is basically equal to e to the j theta, e to the j pi over 2, or simply e to the j theta plus pi over 2. So multiplication by j is simply a rotation, a phase, a phase rotation of pi over 2, which should make sense, right? You take the vector 1 and you rotate it by pi over 2. That's a 90 degree rotation or a pi over 2 rotation. And similarly, multiplying these by j um, is what we get out of this as well. So we can say the real part of... Now, let's take a, take a moment to think about what's going on here. So the real part of e to the j theta plus j pi over 2, this is just this, this part here, is equal to minus sine of theta. So getting to sine of theta, we could multiply by minus 1, and the minus 1 would go in the real part. But remember that minus 1 is also a rotation of pi, because you take the vector 1 and you rotate it around pi degrees. So you can, of course, write it, write the number minus 1 as, if we take the magnitude, is just the magnitude of minus 1 is just 1. So minus 1 quantity squared plus 0 squared. And the angle of minus 1 is equal to the arctangent of 0 over 1. So because there's no imaginary part, so this equals pi as well. Um, and that's because it's over in this quadrant here. You got to be careful that the it's it's yes, it is the arctangent of the imaginary part over the real part, but where these negative signs are in the imaginary and real part actually does tell you where it's gonna be, and that's because of um, basically what, what you see when you plot arctangent. So in other words, what we can say is, that if we divide by minus one, we have the real part of e to the j theta plus pi over two. Now you can say plus pi, or you could say minus pi as well, it doesn't matter because a rotation of 2 pi is simply a full rotation around the unit circle, um, equals the real part of e to the j theta plus 3 pi over 2. This is equal to sine of theta. And then the imaginary part of this guy, so the imaginary part of e to the j theta plus pi over 2 is equal to simply cosine of theta. So if we take this result, we take this result, we take this result, 
and we take this result. And what we basically have is rather than working in terms of sines and cosines when we're dealing with problems or transfer functions, we can simply represent them as the real or imaginary part of a complex exponential, do the problem, do the derivatives, integrals, anything like that in terms of a complex exponential, and then at the end take the real or imaginary part, whatever it is you need to get back to the original signal. This is a great way to do this to, to basically be able to, um, to, to work easily because rather than having to remember all of your trigonometry, your sine and cosine, what these things are, you simply first transform it into e to the j theta into the real or imaginary part of some complex number. Usually it's, it's easier to do it in, in, <laughs> in one of these two ways in my opinion if it's one of them, but of course you can do it however you want to. Solve the problem in terms of your complex exponentials and then transform it back when you're done. So I'll do a few demos and in addition to this, I will show you why sine and cosine are, why, why they have the standard form. Like for instance, we know that cosine of theta is equal to e to the j theta plus e to the minus j theta over two and sine of theta is equal to e to the j theta minus e to the minus j theta over 2j. Now, one of the ways you can see this is simply by looking at, at these different pieces. Um, you, could, you could basically substitute in minus, basically you're taking this plus its conjugate over two to get the real and imaginary parts from this expression. So we've, we've done this in the other videos, but you'll understand now why there's both a positive frequency and a negative frequency term in sine and cosine, and we can write them basically as a sum of phasors as well. So let, let me show you how this works. All right, so what I've done here is I've written the sine and cosine of a complex exponential basically as a function of a frequency that we can adjust, some phase offset we can adjust, and then p is my time index. And I have to use p because t is reserved for me being able to draw these lines. So these are the vectors. I also have my amplitude here so I can scale these if I wanted to, but um, let me just keep this at one. And I'll, I'll provide a link so you can play around with these values. So what we see is what I've done here in green is I've plotted basically using Euler's expression, the phasor here, e to the j theta. And what I'm doing here, the x value is the cosine part and the y value is the sine part. So the reason is there's no j here is because I'm imagining this to be the imaginary axis and I'm imagining this to be the real axis, which is usually how we draw it. And I've also plotted in blue the complex conjugate of this, which if you remember is simply just the negative angle. And you can also do this just by looking at Euler's formula. Of course, cosine's an even function, so it doesn't matter where the minus sign is, but because sine is an odd function, we see this basically flipped. So as I increase P, which is my time index, what I see are two terms, a counterclockwise term in green and a clockwise term in blue as I rotate it around. And of course, if I increase my frequency here, it's they're just gonna spin around faster. So say I bring it up to two, and sure enough, what do I see? But now it's gonna do two rotations in that same interval from basically zero to one, which once again, it's P, but it's my time index. So why am I doing this? Why do I wanna show this? Well, I wanna show why positive and negative frequency terms are in every sine and cosine. And this will be really important because I know people get really confused, like what the heck is negative frequency and why does it show up here? Well, to get any real valued signal in the frequency domain, you have to have what's called conjugate symmetry. So it's going to have positive and real parts. A purely real signal in the time domain will have, will be completely even in the frequency domain. So you have some frequency, you're gonna have that frequency present. A completely imaginary signal is going to be odd in the frequency domain. And think about it, right? Cosine is a purely, if you look at this complex exponential, cosine is purely even, and its Fourier transform is frequencies at one and one, basically at both frequencies with the same phase, and then sine you have minus of the negative frequency, so it's completely odd. So what I wanna do now is show, this is now the, let me bring this frequency back to one. I think this will be more clear. And what I wanna do is now plot what's going on here on the cosine wave. So how do we get a cosine wave from these two? Well, if you remember, cosine of theta is simply e to the j theta plus e to the minus j theta all divided by two. So this is the part that's stretched by two and then we're dividing it. So here's my start point 
And what I'm doing here is I'm, I'm adding both that basically the X values of both of these points and I'm adding this to its conjugate and you get over here. Now, as I start increasing my time index, what we end up seeing, and let me add the next one in too, um, we start seeing these kind of diverge, but because we're adding it to its conjugate, the Y values pass out. And what I see at this particular point is this plus this. So notice how as I increase P, my values that I'm adding together from both of these, I'm adding, you know, literally this and this. Um, so if you add them, if you kind of add them together, the Y values are going to cancel and you're going to get right to this particular point. So this will pretty much always be two off. But if we divide by two because of what we see in the expression, you should see these Y values will always line up. Now let me play it. And as you see, it then goes negative. We're adding the two X coordinates. We're always adding the two X coordinates. And what we see at, from both positive and negative complex exponentials or, com or phasers is a purely real signal. Um, and I'm just plotting it here like this. So it's always gonna be along the number line like this. Now, what happens when I plot the other side of this? So this would be like the sine term, which is basically going to be this vector or th this complex exponential minus its conjugate divided by 2j. So this is the two part. Let me go ahead and, and play what we, what we see here. Whoop. And what you see at any given point is we're adding the distance, the y value, because we're adding this and then we're subtracting this guy. So we're adding this and then we're going to basically go from here all the way up here. And this is going to be the, that vector that is the difference, which you see being plotted here. So it comes around and then it kind of, you can see this is just directly the length that you see from both of these and it does its full rotation. And as we increase or decrease the frequency, the frequency of the sine wave that's traced out um, basically shows up. Now, the reason you divide by 2j is so you're actually plotting it on the imaginary axis. So it's going up and down and not left and right along the real axis. But hopefully what this does is this shows you why sine and cosine both have positive and negative frequency terms. Only adding one complex exponential that's rotating around will always have positive or will always have real and imaginary parts. So in order to get simply the real part of the sine or the cosine, and I, of course I can take the two out here so that they're a little bit more consistent. Um, in order to do this, you would need to show both particular points. So let me play this one more time. And you can see this is what we see. And of course, if we at increase the phase offset, which is the start point, everything shifts and moves around as well, like so. So hopefully this explains what negative frequency is. It's simply the, the conjugate part that allows you to recover either the real or purely imaginary part of the signal that allows us to have these sort of orthonormal basis functions is, is kind of the technical way of saying it. But this really does allow you to see how phasers are, how they're useful, and the relationship between sine, cosine, and complex exponentials. So thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.